welcome St. Matthew's family to the sermon segment of the service. And we're going to do something a little bit different today, very different. This is very unique. Um, what you are witnessing right now is a Zoom recording. Um, we are recording this sermon segment and um, Steve Feldman is the host of this Zoom se segment. And um, we've asked him to sort of be our control room person uh, during this, this segment. So you'll be seeing his picture up on uh, here as we progress through this segment. Um, I've asked Reverends D David and Brenda Ritterpush to join in this unusual format. It's a discussion time about today's lectionary text. We're going to throw theological ideas in this, this mixing bowl, if you will, as we're in the kitchen. And we're going to make some sermon cake. And then we're going to bake it at the end, turn up the heat a little bit, and um, see what this cake looks like. And then probably going to make you hungry by the time that uh, we're done with this. As a matter of introduction about the Ritter Pushes, um, St. Matthew is blessed to have five pastors as members of the small, of the small church. Uh, only one of the pastors is on staff, and that is myself. Uh, three of the pastors are retired, the Ritter Pushes, and then there's also the, the Reverend Mimi Ruth in the congregation. And one, uh, the Reverend Jackie Roderick, serves as a chaplain over in York County for Wellspan Hospitals. So we're very blessed to have this richness of pastoral uh, uh, care and, and pastoral uh, thought, and I, I am just so blessed uh, to have uh, these folks in the congregation. You may wonder what it takes to build and write and deliver a sermon on any given week. This is one of the steps in the process. Now, we don't always get on Zoom, but this is one of the steps in the process. Um, there's this throwing out of ideas into the mixing bowl. It's just one of the steps. And of course, every proclaimer, whoever that is, one who is working on a sermon has a different style. And it's the Holy Spirit that's going to work through all of us in a different way. The Holy Spirit works in another way too. The Holy Spirit's been working on you, believe it or not. Um, you probably wondered what those, uh, what those uh, moments were when you felt the hairs rise on your arms or whatever. That's the Holy Spirit working on you in preparation to, to prepare your ears um, to hear the word as well. And that happens all in a, in a Holy Spirit um, timely fashion. When we put this idea together, Pastors Ritter Push and I studied the texts from Jeremiah and Romans and Matthew and the Psalm, and we met again to review what it was that we had gleaned from the scriptures, sort of a, a trial run, if you will, to put our ideas together. And now today, we're meeting again with you. And, and we've recorded this. And I hope this is beneficial to you to see how this process works and to see some additional thoughts that are put in there from the studies of the scripture and from our own personal lives and, and our own ministries um, uh, where this information comes from. So I know timing is of the essence, and I've taken enough time up, and I don't want you to fall asleep at your kitchen table or your living room chairs, wherever you're, re you're viewing us from. So I'm going to ask uh, Reverend uh, David, Pastor David, first to start with his thoughts on Jeremiah, and then uh, Brenda will guide us through her thoughts on Romans, and then I'll take the Matthew text, and then we'll mix that batter together, and we'll see what flavored cake God has for all of us today. So without further ado, Pastor David. Thank you. Good morning and uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm going to just share some words of background if I can uh, in the Old Testament uh, before dealing directly with Jeremiah. When I was a kid, I thought the Old Testament was extraordinarily dry and boring. Well, uh, I abandoned that idea a long time ago and have really come to embrace the thought that the Old Testament is uh, a record of a faith walk. 
and a faith walk that struggles to answer the question, who do you trust? And the lens through which I look at Old Testament writings is the people of God wrestling with, are we going to trust what God has to say? Or are we going to capitulate and, and listen to other voices? And the story of the Old Testament that uh, goes into bondage in Egypt and uh, the great faith walk out and back to the promised land it is, in fact, a struggle to, to put your hand in the hand of God and let God lead you, or to be enticed and led uh, astray and away and follow other voices. Uh, this morning we have uh, the, the writings from what uh, folks call the weeping prophet, uh, Jeremiah, one of what uh, we look at as the three major prophets in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and uh, Ezekiel. Uh, Jeremiah comes at a very pivotal time in the history of the Old Testament. There are maybe four or five critical dates uh, in the Old Testament. There's the time when uh, the people are willing to listen to uh, God's leading through uh, the, uh, the judges, but then they decide maybe that's not who we really want to trust. There are kings everywhere around us. Let's have, a, let's have kings too. And uh, for a period of time, they decide they're willing to listen to God through uh, Saul, David, and Solomon, but eh, maybe we want to go our own separate ways. And, uh, and the 12 tribes uh, separate into a northern and southern alliance known as the Kingdom of Israel and the Kingdom of Judah. They can't quite keep it together. They're enticed to, to not listen to God and trust God, and the, the northern kingdom uh, falls away. Uh, is conquered uh, finally by the Assyrians. But the southern, the southern kingdom, the two tribes uh, who do business together as the kingdom of Judah, exist uh, from 922 to 587. And 587 is the critical date. And then that's the date that we're sneaking up to in today's lesson from Jeremiah. Uh, the, the Babylonians and the Egyptians are the two mega powers in the biblical world at the time, sort of, sort of like compared to what we would have thought of as, in our time, the Russians and the Americans. And it's a very tense time between these two superpowers of Babylon and Egypt, and they've been mm. fighting a world war, and they've been trying to get uh, little countries to align with them and they ask uh, uh, the, the little group uh, of Judah uh, where Jeremiah is to align. And, and Jeremiah says, don't line up. Don't, don't do this. Uh, don't be frightened. God will protect us. But uh, the who do you trust gets answered with, let's make some military alliances. The, uh, the alliance is made uh, with, uh, with uh, Egypt. And would you believe in the, in the World War, the Babylonians beat the Egyptians, and now the Babylonians are going to come to town. They're going to come to Jerusalem and kick butt because of uh, the, the Jews aligning with losers. And, and now the, the Babylonians are poised to exact retribution. And the story today from Jeremiah is the question of, do we want to, do we Jews want to make some military alliances and try and uh, hold, the, hold the Babylonians at bay? Or are we going to trust God to deliver us? And Jeremiah gets right to it again, saying you need to trust God and stop making these military alliances. So there's this uh, wrestling match going on between two prophets at the time, Jeremiah, the prophet of God, the demonstrating prophet, and another prophet by the name of Hananiah. 
Hananiah saying, make these military alliances. That's how it's going to work best for it. And Jeremiah says, no, 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 no. And the proof of it is if what Hananiah is saying, uh, if there's peace in a year, you'll know Hananiah was right. But uh, what happens in a year is Hananiah is dead. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon marches through, uh, destroys the Solomon's temple, and uh, the Jews are taken into captivity for about 50 years in, in uh, 587. So it's a pivotal time. It's a wonderful opportunity to wrestle with the question of who do you trust? Are you going to trust God or political alliances? Which voice, which shepherd do you follow? That's what I have to say. Thank you. Okay, uh -huh. I'm, I'm working on Romans 6, 12 to 23. And I'm going to let you look over my shoulder of what I, some of the things that I would look at if I were doing a sermon preparation. And the things that I have for you fall into four quick categories. I'm going to give you some background. I'm going to look at some words. So if you can look up the scripture, it might be more helpful for you to follow along. I'm going to look at a major theme and I'm going to look at a few preaching points on this particular lesson. Now, often when the people who put the lectionary together, this, the series of lessons that we read each week, often they make a very strong connection between the first lesson and the gospel lesson. The epistle lesson, it's uh, most often a letter from Paul, not always, but that may have a real di a direct connection or it may not. Um, and this re reading from Romans is a very different kind of uh, writing. It's not a story. It's a letter that Paul sent to the church at Rome, which is not a church that he had yet visited. Now to remember, Paul was a very well educated Jew. He knew the Jewish law inside out and upside down. Um, and he was a very religious kind of person. You also need to remember that he was the one who was persecuting Christians and uh, he only converted to Christianity after he saw the light as it were and was knocked off of his horse and he had this experience of Jesus. So part of what this book is, is trying to show how the Jewish background fits in with the Christian faith. What's the connection between those two? And since he's a very well-educated uh, person and uh, he's making a very theological statement or a statement of faith that's very logical, very sequential, and in some ways very formal, but very important. And um, he's going to show that while Judaism is, or, or while um, Jesus is rooted, rooted in Judaism, he was a Jew himself, Really, the good news is going to be for all people. This text for preaching, I would look at some of the words that are contrasting words and some of the words that seem kind of similar. And some of the, some of the contrasting words, which shows you that something is important to the writer, is he contrasts sin with obedience a slave and being set free, death and eternal life, what's the role of the law, and what's the law, role of grace. All these words you find in that particular text, they tell you something important is going on there. A similar word that's also very important, he talks about sanctification which is the holy living that the Holy Spirit enables us to live through our baptism. How do we live that holy life and eternal life? Those are connected up. So that's kind of an emphasis also that tells you that that's important. The theme, the question that Paul asks several times and it shows up in, in this particular part of the letter is if you can't earn 
God's favor or the gift of forgiveness in life, if God gives that to you freely because of Jesus, then why refrain from a free for all sinful life? Why not do whatever you want? Because it doesn't matter, God will forgive you anyway. Or as they always said when I was growing up, do what you want Saturday night, just make sure you come to confession on Sunday morning, is what they would always say. Why not do that? Or in trying to connect this up with the first lesson, you could put that question in a little bit different way. And that question would be, on whom will you depend? And let me show you how that works. If you think that you are so good that you can keep all the law all by yourself, then you're depending on yourself. And what Paul says is, you'll fail. He already tried that. You will fail. You will never be good enough. And then I always kind of keep track of the things that come to my mind. And one of the things that came to my mind with this is I thought of Jack Nicholson in, in the movie, As Good As It Gets. And he has a line. He's kind of a selfish, uh, compulsive man in, in that movie. And he, you could just hear him say, I'm dying over here. <laughs> And so if you think you're so good, you can do it by yourself, you're dying over there. So another thing that Paul brings up is and he thinks if, if you're depending upon life to be good, that you can live life without limit, without boundaries. If you can think you can live to sinful excess, then you're wrong and you, you will fail because sin always has consequences and the consequence of sin is death. So guess what? It's Jack Nicholson again. You're dying over there. However, if you live life believing that God is good and depending upon uh, God to be good, then you're living life through the Holy Spirit, through your baptism. You're living life on God's terms. That's what it means to depend upon God. That allow God to enable you to live on God's terms with obedience, right living, right relationship, which, which is what we call righteousness. And that leads to the holy living called sanctification, which leads to life, eternal life, real life, abundant life, what you're really looking for life, which is a life because the Holy Spirit's working through you. It's a life that's beyond yourself. So upon whom will you depend? As Christians, it's easy to say we depend upon God, but the proof is in the pudding. Do you depend upon God by the way that you live? Finally, the last, the last sentence in this scripture is very important. It says the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's just that preposition in. It's so small, but it's so important. We have the free gift of eternal life, not because we're with Jesus, beside Jesus, near Jesus, all of which may be true, but we have it because we're in Jesus Christ. And that's going to connect up with the gospel lesson that pastor's going to talk about. Now, real quickly, some preaching points. If I were preaching on this text, I pray about it. And I'd ask myself some questions, and I usually think the answers to these questions, how it deals with us as people, as persons, how does it deal with our congregation or the church at large, and how do, what does it say to our culture? So five quick points, and those are, have you ever been in a dire place, a sinful place where you couldn't help yourself? And what was that like? because that's what it would be like without Jesus. Second question, what would you do for someone who saved your life? And I've had some people in a parish where that's happened. They could never do enough. There's nothing too small or great that they could do. They do it freely, gladly. They live in awe of the person. And um, 
That's, that's the kind of response that Paul is talking about as being a slave to righteousness. You can't do enough good for God because you're so grateful and so in awe of who God is. Or another way to say it is, I'm not my own person. I belong to God. And that should make a difference. Third, what does it look like to have God as the all-encompassing, all-consuming focal point of our life? Because that's what Paul's talking about. And I think it would involve constant awareness or complete service. When we were in the parish, we always had a saying, and, and it fits in with this, this uh, letter that Paul wrote, get accused of being a Christian and provide enough evidence to be convicted. Mm -hmm. Think about that in your life and in our life together. And finally, when I just emphasize that the life God gives is abundant life, it's the real life that we're really looking for. And because the Holy Spirit working in and through us, being in Christ Jesus, that we are able to live a life beyond anything that we could live for ourselves. So thank you. And pastor, it's up to you for the gospel. Thank you. Those are some rich ingredients that got thrown into that bowl. Wow. That is very, well, I guess I'll say meaty, but I'm looking more like chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> uh, my favorite. So the, the gospel, um, the gospel is sort of the fun part usually because it puts those things in action. Um, and we watched Jesus actually, the word made flesh walking through this world and putting those things in action with all of that behind him. Um, so I appreciate being able to handle this part. It, it occurred to me that you have not heard the gospel yet, and it's a very short reading that I'll share with you. Uh, from Matthew 10, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. In the gospel text, the disciples are, are, have just been sent out by Jesus. Um, and that was our gospel last week um, about sending them out and the hospitality that they may or they may not receive uh, when they give the word. Um, it's interesting that in Brown Bag and Bible on Wednesdays, we're studying the Acts of the Apostles and this richness of the Apostles and the things that they encountered as they they preached the word outside of the synagogue and uh, the religious leaders wanted to know whose name are you doing this in? Who are you connected to, right? With Jeremiah and with uh, Romans. Um, last week we learned about baptism in Romans and how that in baptism we're connected to Christ, that three-legged race thing. Um, so Whose name are you coming in? Who's dragging you into this race? Um, as in the case of the apostles and Acts and with the disciples here in Matthew 10, there are various levels of acceptance and hospitality that the hearers have. Um, last week, Jesus actually told us that scary idea that, that the gospel may actually create division in relationships, division in families. The gospel is powerful. Um, and sometimes the truth hurts. The truth also always hurts. So it's important to be aware of whose name that we are coming in. When, and there's that responsibility in our baptisms as we're connected to Christ. You know, whose name are we coming in? And with the prophet Jeremiah, too, when you, when you think about it, with these alliances that were formed, who's, why are we doing this? You know, whose name are we coming in? Are we trusting in God to do this? Or are we making these things up ourselves? Jesus said, uh, 
If you welcome a stranger, you welcome me. If you welcome me, you welcome to God. And if you give a cup of water to the least of these, after caring enough to listen to the least of these, to know that they're thirsty, to know what it is that they need to throw into that batter, um, I think that's a crucial point there. Um, and I think that that sort of separates the, the folks who are just out there for their own good versus being led by the Holy Spirit to, to give the cups of water. So according to why you want to give a cup of water and who, how closely you're listening to the needs of those around you. So how is it that in our baptismal vocation, we can trust that we are coming in the name of the Lord? Um, how will others know that? Um, Pastor Brenda gave a very important point about sermon prep is the prayer part. You know, we, we seek Christ first. You know, I, I was telling you that this is one of the ways that uh, sermon prep is done in the study of scripture and the hashing out um, usually by ourselves, the Fort Conners do this by ourselves and ask the questions in the mirror um, uh, or the biblical witness or, or other witnesses in books. But um, we ask the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. And, and before we started this recording today, uh, the four of us prayed together about this. Um, so it's important to, for our focal point to be on God you know, it's it's this name going in the name of somebody or in the name of something. It's it's always been popular for politicians to use a name and to for their platform. And every quite a few politicians use a name or a brand and, and they love to use God's name. You know, you want to maybe you'll show a church service or something along their campaign trail. Uh, we're always relying on God to help us. And that can be said for businesses. It can be said for any of us going about our, our work and anything that we want to proclaim. Um, but when you go in God's name, you take God's wishes with you too. Um, the people of Israel with choosing you know, to ally with, with Egypt instead of, instead of Babylon. Yes, I said that right. Um, they, you know, did they go in God's name or did they go in their own name? Uh, because God will change you. Are we going in God's name and God's spirit with a spirit of humility as Jesus did? When Jesus came and he put action, the action uh, on the soil in this world, um, he didn't come to for his own good. Why did he come? As Luther tells us, it's for us and for our salvation that he came. Um, it was for us. He had us in mind. Um, so when we, we see someone coming and, and they give us a word, um, and we hear that word, um, and we welcome them, we are welcoming, welcoming not just the, the person giving the word, but we're giving welcome to God, God himself. Um, so who, who are those people in this world um, that we need to heed and listen to? And where, where is it that God, where is it that the angels that we're entertaining unawares, where is it that we see God in this world? So that's my segment of it. And as I promised, I, I know we're, we're running a little long here, but as I promised, um, we would mix that batter up. We'll get the zzz, whatever that noise is. Uh, mixer. The mixer, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is there a name brand for a mixer that works the best? I don't know about the best, but. <laughs> <laughs> Dropping names here. <laughs> um, I kidded earlier in prep for this about some of it. One of us has to turn the oven on to turn the heat up. That might be. David's job, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how does this all mix together? How, how, do, how do you two hear that? Uh, um, this going in the name of God. 
Well, Reverend. Go ahead. <laughs> Put them on the spot. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think that um, trusting God is not easy. And it's a lifelong calling. And sometimes we do better at it than others. And one of the things, it's easy to do good things for other people. But do we ever ask, is this what you want me to be doing, Lord? And are you sending me here? Or am I doing this just because I want to and out of my own strength? Or do I expect that your Holy Spirit is working in and through me to do things larger than I could ever do, even if I never see what those things are? And so I think it's very important to be conscious and pray and be aware of God's presence and ask what God wants us to do instead of just deciding we think this is a good thing to do. Yeah, I, one of the things that, that I would lift up, and it's, it's certainly uh, in Paul's life and, and exquisitely in Jeremiah's, is the willingness to, uh, in, in, in discerning what God wants, the willingness to be unpopular mm. and to speak a word of truth in some arenas that don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. and to be willing to live uh, a word of truth in times that uh, it's very unpopular. Uh, Pastor, I, I know that you know this, but, you know, uh, you know Jeremiah, Jeremiah is, is an exquisitely demonstrating uh, proclaimer of the word. He didn't just speak it, he demonstrated it. And what would it be for us who come to worship to see our pastor demonstrating uh, out on the, out on the street out out on the sidewalk, you know Jeremiah went around. He said, "If you do this, we're going to all end up in bondage," and he went around with an ox yoke on his shoulders to say, "This is what's coming. Hmm. We're going into bondage." And, and he wasn't just a person of words in what he did. He was, a, he was a, an enactor of what God had laid on him. It, it was every part of his being and fiber. And what a wonderful way to communicate. It, it, it went all the way through his ministry. I heard on... Uh television, like one of the legal terms with justice is to enact it, <clears throat> pardon me, without fear or favor. And to speak God's word like Jeremiah did, without fear of the consequences, no matter what consequences came, and without uh, seeking favor, because you already have God's favor, or using it to gain other people's favor, is, is really tough. It's it, it's like threading a needle to, to serve God in complete obedience without fear or favor, I thought was a very powerful kind of little phrase. Yeah, all of these folks, all of these lessons are in an arena, uh, generally standing against popularity, if you will, against majority, speaking, speaking a word that many folks at the time just really don't want to hear and being so in God, if you will, that we're, that the speaker is committed to speaking God's word, God's word, <laughs> not, not his own, not her own, but God's word. I often would say being a prophet uh, for God, uh, the, the task is simple. It's simple. And the simplicity of it is, it's not your words. Mm -hmm. It's God's words. Just say God's words. That's the simple part. It's not easy. It's not easy, but it's simple. Be connected to and be faithful to God's word. Thank you. 
those are good time those are good things to know and to stay connected to we we all know that we we live in these crazy times especially in these last couple of months and um i was watching on the news this morning about this uh dust that's coming in from somewhere africa or whatever that's hitting the south that yes uh, <laughs> it's raining mud down south so i mean we've seen so many strange things going on and 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 people are fearful the people our neighbors are fear, fearful we need to listen to that and we are fearful too and so um, listening to god staying in tune with god and asking god how it is that we can be um, how we can offer cups of water to our neighbors um, is, is crucial in this time what a blessing this sermon prep time has been and um, i can smell I can smell a cake. I think it might be getting ready to come out of the oven. Um, and you can probably smell your lunches too. <laughs> yeah. Right now, if that's what, if this is the time that you're watching this video. I, I thank God for the witness of uh, David and Brenda Ritterpush. I thank God for the witness of Stephen Feldman, who has been our control guy today. I thank God for leading us all to this place today. I thank God for you. I thank God for your witness and, and this church and all who are watching in this day. Know that God is with you and God will not lead us astray. Amen. Amen.